Ireland and Scotland are similar in many ways. Blessed with wild, beautiful landscapes from Ben Nevis to the Cliffs of Moher, their peoples share a Gaelic heritage, a hardiness against cold and damp, a love of good whisky, and above all, a deep distrust of the English. What news of the North? In more recent years, these Celtic cousins have demonstrated another similarity, their government's impressive track record at ruining their housing markets. Any policy can be ranked along two measures, its popularity with the voting public and its effectiveness. Examples of broadly popular good policies are free primary school education and the plastic bag levy. Politicians love such policies for obvious reasons, and we'll call these low-hanging fruit. Next, we have unpopular good policies, such as raising the retirement age with an aging population. Politicians avoid such policies if they can, and we'll call these courageous. Then there's unpopular bad policies, which are rare for obvious reasons, but not unheard of. An example would be Margaret Thatcher's poll tax, which led to a revolt in Scotland and ultimately her downfall. We'll call these political suicide. Finally, we have the deadliest of all, popular bad policies, more commonly known as populism, an example of which is the subject of this video, rent controls. Whenever a city has rising rents, like we see everywhere from Glasgow to Cork and Edinburgh to Dublin, a politician invariably calls for rent controls. And of course, the public loves it. After all, who wants to pay more rent? There's only one problem. Rent controls have a terrible track record. According to Nobel Prize winning economist Paul Krugman, the analysis of rent control is among the best understood issues in all of economics, and among economists anyway, one of the least controversial. In 1992, a poll of the American Economic Association found 93% of its members agreeing that a ceiling on rents reduces the quality and quantity of housing. Former chair of the Nobel Prize Committee, Asar Lindbeck, put it bluntly, rent control appears to be the most efficient technique presently known to destroy a city, except for bombing. Politicians looking for a simple solution to the housing crisis, then rent controls are it. Um, and, you know, it's not just Ireland that, that's reached for that solution. You can see it, you know, over Europe, you can see it in the United States, you can now see it in, in Scotland. There's someone easy to blame here. You know, it's greedy landlords, and therefore if we just stop the landlords being greedy, that stops the rents going up. Whereas the reason for rent increases are much more complicated than that. And supply and availability is usually at the root cause for these crises. So uh, doing something that's actually going to make the supply situation worse and not better is not really generally the best economic way to go about it. The economics textbooks tell us that, like any market, housing consists of supply and demand. If there is a spike in housing demand, rents will rise, at least temporarily. But this new, higher price behaves like a signal that indicates there's money to be made. Landlords and home builders will respond by renting out spare rooms and building more housing the ultimate effect of which is to increase supply and bring prices back down. This price signal, or price mechanism, is fundamental to the efficient allocation of resources in an economy. But when a government sets a price ceiling, it dims the price signal and reduces the incentive to build new housing. The resulting shortfall leads to rationing in the form of queues and black markets of various kinds. What's more, rent controls and their accompanying regulations send a negative signal to the market which can reduce the supply that's already there. But how can this be? The houses don't just disappear. To understand it, we need to think of housing as not one, but four markets. Long-term lets, short-term lets such as Airbnb, second homes, and owner-occupied homes. Rent controls and related measures make market one less attractive, so landlords react by moving to the other three. This leads to calls for a clampdown on short-term lets by ways of bans, licensing, and fines, but these are hard to police and won't stop landlords using their property as a second home or selling up. What follows are recurring cycles of harder measures and head scratching before government does the hardest thing of all, admit it was wrong. Ireland and Scotland introduced rent controls in 2016, both naming them rent pressure zones. But while Ireland's took effect soon after and slowly spread across the country, Scotland's were left to local authorities who didn't implement them as the evidential bar wasn't met. So Holyrood introduced rent controls for the whole country in 2022, despite futile calls to take heed of the lessons from Ireland. International examples determine how disastrous rent policy rent controls are. They're living with them. They introduced them in 2016, and the Irish have seen the number of homes available to rent plummet. And as of August this year, only 716 homes were available to rent. 
in a country with a population of 5.1 million people. A byproduct of this shocking increase is homelessness. If we advertise the property, then it's no exaggeration to say that there's 100 to 200 households applying for that property. We have locked the door in our office. The building that we're in at the moment, we're upstairs. That's not by mistake. So people would typically think of property service providers as like, you know, like a retail store walk-in, which is what we would have been. And that's changed. So like the level of distress in the market, rent controls sound good. I get that. So people would say, oh, you're protecting the most vulnerable people in society. Well, actually, the best way to protect people is to have more supply. And if you intervene in the market and that reduces supply, so does your good intention negate the negative results? I would argue not. I don't think that the legislators intended to increase the level of misery in the market. But have they? Yes, they have. Have rent controls worked? No. It's a two-tier market. So the people who live in rent-controlled properties have much lower rents than the market. And any anybody who's outside it, there are lots of properties that are exempt from rent pressure zones, like new supply. Those rents have skyrocketed. According to economist John Fitzgerald, once you go down the road of rent control, the supply of rental accommodation will gradually dry up and any new rentals will come at an increasingly high price. Landlords are not a popular cohort of society, but a survey by the Residential Tenancies Board, the Irish rental regulator, shows that 83% of private renters' experience are positive to very positive. Most landlords historically don't increase their rents at all on an annual basis. So we've got landlords saying to us now, I haven't increased my tenant's rent for seven to 10 years. I've got a long-term tenant, they're great, we've got a good relationship. I haven't needed to increase that rent, but I wasn't expecting these costs to increase the way they have. So now I'm gonna to have to increase my rent. Uh, and they found themselves in a trap where they can't increase the rent and their costs are going up and therefore they can no longer afford to operate that property. In Ireland, registered tenancies peaked in 2016, the same year as rent control legislation was introduced and have been declining ever since. Notices of termination have increased steadily, from a few hundred per quarter to over 4,000 per quarter today. These notices typically take the form of a text message from a landlord citing one of the permitted reasons, such as renovation of the property, needing the property back for themselves or a family member, or most common of all, the landlord selling the property. These terminations result in real stress and hardship for renters, and they have a cascading effect. The decreasing rental supply makes it harder for people to find somewhere else, leading to long queues and more time spent house hunting. The increasing desperation invites calls for harder government measures, such as rent freezes and eviction bans, which causes landlords to flee the market even faster. The reduced supply means that landlords remaining in the market can afford to be extra choosy about who they let into their property, which disproportionately affects those with children or pets or others in society deemed to be less desirable. It also creates perverse incentives for bribes and black markets. According to economist Ronan Lyons, rent controls simply create new tiers on which the scarce housing is rationed. Evidence from elsewhere is that discrimination is a key dimension along which scarce housing gets allocated. But should a government just let rents run wild? A house is somebody's home, and people need certainty of tenure, rental agreements aside. Many well-meaning people, including some economists, believe that rent controls have a part to play, at least until a city can get ahead of its supply shortages. Rent controls were first introduced during the First World War, when rents in cities like Glasgow rose, as people moved to work in munitions factories and in the wider war effort. Originally intended as a temporary six-month measure, rent controls proved almost impossible to repeal, and continued in various guises up to and beyond World War II until they were finally repealed in England and Wales in 1988. Wartime rent controls tended to be hard, which is to say they didn't take inflation into account or include other exceptions, causing properties to fall well behind market rates. This created an insider-outsider dynamic. Some people found themselves with bargains and little incentive to move out or economize on space, while others struggled to find a place. Landlords not able to cover their costs began to cut back on maintenance, leading to disrepair and even dereliction. Few economists today support hard rent controls, 
Modern, softer rent controls include features such as exceptions for new builds and allowances for rents to rise with inflation or by a permitted percentage, which was set at 4% in Ireland and 3% in Scotland. But technocrats who propose soft rent controls underappreciate the slippery slope on which they're setting the political system. Rent controls are like concrete. They harden once rolled out. It doesn't take long for an opposition party to insist that a 4% cap should be 0%, and the problem of landlords leaving the market is easily solved with an eviction ban. And it's been shown, in places like Ontario, that the mere debate of rent controls has a cooling effect on supply, as housing projects are cancelled in expectation of upcoming changes. In Scotland, while rent controls didn't take effect until 2022, the debate and introduction of the 2016 legislation seems to have affected supply. But the best data that we have from the availability of new tenancies as well as from land registration suggests that supply has been on a downward trend uh, since around about 2015, 2016, when the initial private residential tenancies bill uh, was introduced. So in Scotland, we've got rising demand, but falling supply. We should have rising supply in order to meet the rising demand, but we've got falling supply and hence that's why rents have been um, increasing. Just a quick note, to invite you to join our membership program at patreon.com forward slash policy for sneak peeks of future episodes and discussions on our Discord channels about politics, economics and much more. Now, back to the video. On the demand side, Scotland and Ireland are experiencing net inward migration, a relatively new phenomenon for both countries that their political classes are struggling to deal with. Many commenters on this channel have expressed concerns about immigration, and there's no getting around the fact that an increasing population and a rigid planning system will increase housing pressures. But internal factors, such as reducing average household sizes and people moving to urban areas, also drive housing demand. Thankfully, there is broad agreement on the solution. Supply, supply, supply. The problem that we have in Scotland is we have a dire shortage of social affordable homes. That's the issue. But increasing supply isn't easy, even for social housing. The insider-outsider dynamic in rent controls is mirrored in the planning system, which entertains all shades of objections from near and far and gives disproportionate weight to those already on the housing ladder. Those objecting to a new build because it's too tall or not in keeping with the character of the area seek to freeze their city in time. But like prices, cities need to be dynamic if they are to serve society. If people could see what I'm seeing on a daily basis with the number of people applying for one rental property and the personal stories that they're telling us or the level of distress that we're seeing, you would not object to any new property development in Ireland, regardless of what your reason was. Put it over there, over here, in a different place. Not so high, make it lower. Despite the mounting evidence, popular bad ideas tend to stick around. Sweden, for example, still has its wartime rent controls, and waiting lists for new apartments are now running at about seven years. Ireland's controls were repealed in 1981, when the Supreme Court deemed them unconstitutional, and it's unclear whether the courts will intervene again. But might there be a better way to resolve this? Part of the problem is top-heavy centralised government. Having spent so long under the thumb of London, the Irish and Scottish governments don't seem to be big believers in independence, at least when it comes to local government. Ireland is now the second most centralised country in the OECD, and while we only have OECD data for the UK, we know that Scottish rent controls were introduced by Holyrood, not by the local authorities. Every local authority is telling us we know what our landlords are selling in their local areas, and that's impacting in their house, housing and their homelessness provision locally. Social landlords are aware of that too. Uh, all of us, as I say, all of our local authorities are aware of it. So we all know what that reality is. It's just the politicians aren't responding to that. In Ireland, rent pressure zones are administered by central government and apply not just to Dublin, but to Cork, Galway and small towns like Killarney, Westport and Macroom, as well as to their rural hinterlands. Rent pressure zones are in reality political pressure zones, and the pressure builds at the centre. In our view, the only realistic strategy is to move away from angry centralised auction politics towards a localised approach, giving councils the right to opt out and letting the results speak for themselves. Localism concedes that macroeconomics is messy and that it is better to learn by doing than fighting in the national parliament over one-size-fits-all solutions. If a local authority were to opt out, it would be wise to give plenty of notice, say 18 months, which would act as a green signal to increase supply, 
while giving renters enough time to adjust. This should be combined with a liberalization of obstructive planning and zoning policies, councils investing in social and affordable housing, and rental support for those with the least means to pay. And given the havoc we're seeing in Cork, maybe Cork City would be a good place to start. The social effect is phenomenal. Like, uh, as a small example, last summer, we're upstairs, so we're up on the first floor. We open the window in our office on a hot day and there's people standing outside and they say, hello, hello, please, can you, can you do something for us? And, you know, we want to help people, but when it's 200 people, uh, what I'd like people to do is to imagine a hall a sports hall with 200 people inside in it and each of them raising their hand saying me me uh, i have a really bad situation you need to help me so it's beyond hopeless with an election approaching in ireland popular bad ideas will be in plentiful supply and as opposition politicians promise to harden rent controls even further there is a bright red signal flashing for landlords to leave the market which stands to make things even worse the last time Ireland had too many popular bad ideas, the country had to seek an international bailout led by the IMF, which recently advised Ireland to remove rent controls due to the damage they were doing. As it happens, Irish government minister Pascal Donoghue is a leading contender to become the next head of the IMF. He was present in that fateful cabinet meeting on rent controls in 2016, but despite reported warnings from officials and probably from himself, his party pushed them through anyway. Expect this to come up in the job interview.